Hi there everybody, I'd like to speak today on Margaret Thatcher and uh, another topic uh, towards the end called stars. Um, I thought it would be an appropriate place to speak today from this cemetery here because supposedly and seemingly this is where we all end up. The good, the great and everything in between. Margaret Thatcher's legacy to the people of the United Kingdom, um, the legacy from the Iron Lady, um, stares us firmly in the face today. Um, David Cameron, William Hague, all the great statesmen that are statesmen so-called, eulogize uh, about her and say that she did a fantastic job for the country and was a great leader. Um, what many of you don't realize is that Margaret Thatcher was given an agenda, uh, a very difficult agenda, but an agenda nevertheless given to her by the Rothschild family. The agenda, put simply, was to break the unions in the United Kingdom in order to instigate a, uh, a credit bubble or a credit squeeze eventually uh, and so initiate a much greater degree of control of the masses and of the people who had power uh, to organize themselves within uh, a union structure or when, within a corporate environment. Now first of all what she came in to do was to break the miners and to break the miners strike. Um, the Thatcher government needed to do this for the simple reason that there are various what's called hidden doctrines within classical Marxism. And one of the hidden doctrines within Marxism states that eventually the working classes will rebel to such an extent and ask for such outrageous demands that they will alienate themselves not only from the people but also from um, the, their, own, their own union membership. And what was happening then, in effect, in those days, through the 60s, 70s and 80s, is if anybody wanted, within a union environment, to raise their level of their income, what they would do is they would negotiate with the, work, uh, the management, and if that was unsuccessful, then they would threaten action and eventually threaten strike action and instigate that strike action in order to get an increase in their weekly uh, salary or week weekly paycheck. Now the problem with that is it places very firmly the power to regulate a part of the money supply in the hands of the unions or the union uh, representatives. And Thatcher was told to break this at all costs. And the reason for that is that credit was the way of the future because as the old Knights Templar uh, maxim uh, went, you wrap your uh, enemy in either one of three things. That was either in litigation, as King John used to do very successfully, wrap them in debt or wrap them in a shroud. And so with the Thatcher government, their main agenda given to them by the banking community was to ensure that from that point on, the breaking of the strike, um, that the unions were dismantled and that anyone thereafter who wanted money had to go to one source only and that was to the banks, the loan companies um, and take credit agreements and that's where she led us. So in effect the privatization program that she cascaded through the country from the privatization of um, the gas companies, the electricity companies, the power companies, the um, rail network, the, uh, the fuel and food distribution networks, everything was brought into this, this Thatcher capitalist um, regime and we all know that capitalism does work very very well. The proof of it working very well is staring us right in front of our faces today and capitalism does work but it works very well for the capitalist. And if you look around the globe, you see the capitalist fail model from capitalist Indonesia, capitalist India, capitalist China, capitalist Pakistan, capitalist South America, capitalist Brazil, capitalist Argentina. Quite an incredible uh, array of 
capitalist models where the percentage of the wealth, the 95% of the wealth, still remains in the hands of the, the 1%, not even. Touching on this point, um, Buenos Aires, Argentina, when Margaret Thatcher uh, waged a war uh, over the Falkland Islands, uh, one of the things that she was most regarded for as having a, a resolve of steel and became the, the Iron Lady, uh, in part, what happened there uh, that many people don't realise is that the French Prime Minister at the time, uh, I think it was uh, President Mitterrand in France, uh, was given an ultimatum by Margaret Thatcher. This is revealed in the, uh, the biography of the psychiatrist, a Muslim man in Paris who used to treat uh, Mitterrand for a range of, uh, shall we say, psychological um, psychological problems that he might have suffered from whilst in office. Uh, one of the things he was keeping hidden from everybody was the fact that he had a, a daughter that no one knew about, uh, one he'd, uh, uh, which will, uh, doesn't really need to concern us now. But the bottom line was that the, the psychiatrist reveals in the biography about Mitterrand that uh, an ultimatum had been given to him by Margaret Thatcher that if he didn't produce for the British government the secret codes for, for the dismantling or disarming of the Exocet missiles which had become the one single deterrent and threat to which the British Navy and the British uh, military forces there had no answer for. It was an, a, a work of art, if you could have such a, as that, uh, made by the French. Uh, which the British had no answer for, that if he didn't reveal these codes to her, then what she was prepared to do was to launch a nuclear missile at Buenos Aires. Mitterrand, even in his disturbed state, thought this was the, the, the threat and the act of a lunatic, but he was convinced in the end that, that she was possibly prepared to do it, if we can believe the, the psychiatrist. And so what happened is, mysteriously, these codes for the Exocet missiles uh, were released or gotten hold of from Aerospatial in Toulouse and uh, one of the strange coincidences there is that Mitterrand's son uh, just happened to be one of the senior members either of the board or one of the working uh, steering committee members within Aerospatial. So thank you Margaret Thatcher, a great legacy you left behind, we're all benefiting benefiting from it greatly and so uh, the country marches on. The other thing I'd like to touch on is also this warmongering that's going on at the moment in, uh, in uh, North Korea uh, and I want to touch on that because of something quite significant and this is the, the emblem of the star on the flag. Uh, North Korea has a star on its flag. Uh, the United States Air Force has exactly the same star on its flag. Texaco has the same star on its flag. The state of Texas has a star on its flag. The flag of the Confederacy uh, for the Confederate War in the United States had a star on its flag. The Israeli government, the state of Israel, has a star on its flag. Uh, China supposedly a communist country, has a star on its flag. Russia, the Russian military wear a star badge on their caps and have a star on their flag. Uh, many countries display this, this star and what it is, is a Illuminati graffiti from the Zionists. Uh, the actual symbolism of the star goes back way, way, way many thousands of years. Uh, and can also be tied into the pentagram of uh, Leonardo da Vinci. But the main point I'm making here is that when you look at how many countries of the world actually display stars on their flags, we see that there are around, around maybe 65 to 75, it could be 85 uh, countries uh, display these stars. Um, and so what you know for sure is that if you're displaying the star, you are part of a, uh, a, a, a network, a grid of connectivity. Uh, 
that's one point. So what we know here is that the Illuminati are playing good cop, bad cop. They're trading the aggression off against the uh, North Koreans with the South Koreans. They're bringing in the Chinese, bringing in the Russians, till we're all supposedly running around chasing our own tail, not knowing who friend or foe is. But the biggest, largest number of stars on any flag, I do believe, in the world is to be found on the flag of the United States of America. So that goes some way into explaining the founding of the United States and the intentions uh, behind that founding and the repercussions that are, are being, uh, shall we say, uh, assimilated by it into the world today. On the star uh, moniker or uh, nomenclature, you also see that there are everyone who's in a, a, in a, in a role of, uh, of becoming famous, whether he's working for a pop group or in a pop group, whether he's playing music, whether he's a film star, whether he's the movie star, whether he's just the child at school that the teacher says, oh, what a star you are. Everybody these days is a star, and stars are used to sell everything. It's the global second, um, uh, probably largest symbol after the, the dollar for understanding maybe a bargain or an offer. Um, the word star actually has an origination around, shall we say, 1180, 1190, definitely by 1200, uh, in the court of star chamber in England. So King John was one of the legendary, uh, what's called Angevin, comes from Merovingian. If you haven't seen The Matrix, please have a look at that to explain some of the, the, the power uh, prescribed to the Merovingian dynasty, which includes all the Louis, um, the Carolingians as well. Um, that King John was an expert in enmeshing his enemies in debt. And one of the things that the Court of Star Chamber um, a secretive court where disputes primarily regarding taxation and money were heard was a mispronunciation of the Hebrew word shatar. Yeah, I know it sounds a bit like, but it isn't. It's the Hebrew word shatar. And shatar stood for an agreement. That was an agreement invariably between a Gentile and a Jew for repayment of money at interest. And this uh, word, over time, has been used to signify that anyone that is under an obligation or a so-called binding agreement with a Jew to pay money is referred to as a shatar agreement. And so we've all been labelled stars for supposedly being now in the, in the grasp and very firmly uh, indebted, illegally and unlawfully, may I add, to a Zionist-controlled banking cartel with its origins which go back way, way, way past um, the pharaohs of Egypt into the uh, Harian and Hittite, uh, Syrian, Babylonian era, and then back before that onto the, uh, the Anunnaki who were on the planet uh, quite some, some multi-millennia ago. And the placeholders for them today uh, are invariably the, the Zionist cabal, which would profess to be the chosen people, chosen because they have a, a, a difference or an extension within their genetic code, um, genome project, um, DNA sampling of everyone and anything for particular reasons, which we can go and uh, to uh, at another occasion. So what I'm trying to do today is to bring some of the, the background behind the clandestine, tyrannous, uh, criminally debauched regimes from Obama and Cameron and Blair and Reagan and Jimmy Carter and way the way back to even the founders of the United States of America who founded it on uh, classical Roman uh, tenets uh, and even placed the White House on a small tributary off the Potomac called the River Tiber, um, the Capitol building with all Roman and church uh, um, nomenclature, 
Um, so this is really where I want to take that today. And so uh, it's uh, uh, hopefully hopefully you'll find this of interest. And so well done, Maggie. Um, pity that you've gone, uh, but I'm sure there's going to be uh, quite a lot of tears cried for you. But uh, just like the crocodile's tears on the Nile, um, not that many will miss you. Um, thank you. Don't forget to press subscribe and uh, pass this on to your friends. Thank you.